list include Christopher Hitchens of Vanity Fair and Republican pollster Frank Lutz. Fred Barnes of the Weekly Standard moderates this forum, hosted by the American Enterprise Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, we're ready to uh, start the second panel of today, which will focus on the next Congress. Uh, on behalf of the American Enterprise Magazine, I'd like to thank our distinguished panelists for coming today. And it's also uh, my pleasure to introduce their ringmaster, Carlin Bowman. Uh, she's famous as uh, Washington's premier pollmeister. She's a resident fellow with the American Enterprise Institute uh, and opinion, uh, opinion pulse editor as well for the American Enterprise Magazine under whose auspices uh, these talks are taking place today. Uh, her latest book, co-authored with uh, Everett Carl Ladd, is Public Opinion in America and Japan, How We See Each Other and Ourselves. And of course, she's a regular panelist with AEI's Popular Election Watch series. Carlin? Thank you very much, Scott. I'd like to um, add my welcome to all of you to the American Enterprise Magazine's roundtable on the next Congress. Um, let me take just a moment to briefly introduce our panelists. Um, as you've probably noted by this time, Fred Barnes is uh, missing in action at this point. He's circling uh, around Baltimore, we think. Uh, the rains have kept him from being here, and we're hoping that he'll be able to join us a little later in the session. To my left, um, but certainly not politically, <laughs> is uh, Mike Ferris, uh, known to many of you as the Republican candidate for Lieutenant Governor of Virginia in 1993, and now very, very active and president of the Home School Legal Defense Association. Mike is also founder of the Madison Project, which raises money and provides volunteers for like-minded Republican candidates. And he's just told me about uh, something that's coming up in the next month. I hope all of you will watch for her the debut of his novel, Anonymous Tip, uh, in November? First of October. First of October. I'll look forward to that. Christopher Hitchens, on his left, is a columnist for The Nation and also for Vanity Fair, a, a prolific journalist in both the United States and England. And his books include, For the Sake of Argument, Blood, Class, and Nostalgia, Anglo-American Ironies, and his latest book, The Missionary Position, a book about Mother Teresa. Frank Luntz, to my right, um, is the president of Luntz Research um, and the pollster of record for the contract with America in 1992. He was named one of the 50 rising stars in American politics by campaigns and election magazines and has, I think, the very impressive distinction of having won the Washington Post Crystal Ball Competition Award for the most accurate pundit in uh, 1992. Last but not least, on his right is Grover Norquist, uh, President of Americans for Tax Reform. Um, he writes a regular column for the American Spectator, the politics column, and is also author of the very successful Rock the House, uh, a book that described the change, the massive change that we saw in congressional elections in 1994. Grover, I'd like to begin with you this morning by asking you a, a broad question. A number of observers have suggested that this, um, this fall's congressional elections um, will be among the most important in the country's history. Um, is that just election year hyperbole, or is there more at stake in this election than usual? Well, for the House and the Senate, I think there is, but particularly the House. If the Republicans maintain control, maintain their majority in the House, uh, you're looking at a situation where the Republicans could keep that majority for 20 or 30 years, because not only this election where I think the Republicans will actually pick up seats uh, even if Clinton uh, runs a strong presidential race. Uh, but two years from now, there are a whole series of Democrats in marginal or Republican seats that are hanging around to see if the Democrats are coming back into power. Uh, and if they don't, I think across the South and the Midwest, you have a second tier of retirements coming uh, that will even will solidify the Republican control. and. You could see it continue for 20 or 30 years with no reason to see the Democrats able to come back to, to take control of the House. If you have 51 votes in the Senate, you don't control the Senate. But if you have 51 percent of the House, you have control of the House. So the, the House is more important than the Senate in terms of maintaining control. And I would argue this election will decide who runs the House for the next 20 years. Christopher, do you agree? Is this an historic election? Yes, I do think so. I, I'm in the weird position of wanting to recommend a, a piece that some of you may have read, and all of you ought to, in a commentary magazine. Um, 
by Daniel Cass. Um, it's called Party of One. Um, it's a study of Mr. Clinton's relationship to this Congress and the next one. Uh, Mr. Cass, who I don't know, um, worked in the Bush White House and also directed the, for his sins the Lamar Alexander campaign. But what he, what he point, I'll just, if I may, I'll just quote a little yes, from this very suggestive piece. What he says, and what I've got every reason to think is true from conversations with members of the Clinton entourage, is that the, um, the truly emancipating moment for the Clinton presidency came when the Democrats were destroyed in the, in the House. That, that allowed him to be uh, unbearably light, to rise clear of his party. And I think it, w it will be found in general to be true that he will do well when his party does least well. And that for him, um, th it, this was a really essential, so to speak, defeat. Um, what well, I'll, I'll just quote, if I may, from Mr. Cass's conclusion. Far from trying to rebuild his party, Clinton is trying to decouple the presidential engine from the congressional train. He has learned how the Republicans can be at once a steady source of new ideas and a perfect foil. I think that's very well and pungently put. I think the counterpart to it probably holds true as well, which is the best test of a hypothesis. If you pretend just for the moment, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for an exercise to be Newt Gingrich, imagine yourself to be Mr. Gingrich. Get up in the morning, be Mr. Gingrich. Come down to breakfast, see Mrs. Gingrich there, um, that kind of thing. Actually be him. What do you, who do you want to be president in the fall? Obviously you don't want a mediocre, um, senile, moderate Republican. Um, what you want is Bill Clinton, from your point of view, to be the president. Uh -huh. And I think that probably um, all, the, all the sides in this argument, which pleases me because it makes nonsense of the current um, formulaic uh, style of bipartisanship, um, my, my view of that is always, um, as with Mr. Perot, uh, the difficulty in starting a third party in this country is that there are not yet two parties. Um, I think that uh, the, the, this election will probably um, be the first, so to speak, bipartisan election of the new style, mm -hmm. and it will lead to that kind of a Congress. Mm -hmm. right. And that will emancipate mm -hmm. us, in turn, mm -hmm. from the idiotic donkey-elephant discourse that's dominated uh, mm -hmm. everything from her block cartoons to Crossfire um, for so long. Uh, Frank, I can't personally you, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, would you agree, is it a fundamental realignment? And I wonder if you could try to put that in perspective by talking a little bit about the country's mood and uh, what, what people are thinking about as they cast their votes this fall. Well, this is the continuing effort in post-partisan politics. The fact is that 1992 was really the first election where Republicans and Democrats didn't matter so much. You know, we did this instant response work for ABC News where we tested speech after speech at the Republican and Democratic conventions. And one of the things we found is just mention the word Republican. Lines went down. Mention the word Democrat. Lines went down. People don't want to hear about Republicans and Democrats anymore. You have to be 60 years of age or older or a member of Grover's family to be really partisan <laughs> at this point. The, the, the public has really come to reject that style. Now, it's not to say that they've rejected the ideology of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. They just don't like party labels. And Clinton has done a admirable job, as uh, now speaking as an observer, in blurring the distinction between Republican and Democrat. He truly sounds like a Republican or like a Republican would have, say, 10, 15 years ago. And in fact, if you watched his Memphis speech, even better than his convention, his Memphis speech, where his arms are draped over the podium, and he looked like he was just having this kind of fireside, Roosevelt-style chat. And he went for 35 minutes without a note, without a cue card, with nothing. Talking about, well, we need tax cuts, but. Well, we need a balanced budget, but. Well, we need welfare reform, but. I mean, the man, he is the but president of the <laughs> 1990s, but he's been able to do what Republicans, in a sense, have not been able to do up to this point, which is blur a lot of distinctions and move across towards the independents, uh, kind of blur the lines and enable himself to attract voters that in 1994 found him abhorrent. Mm -hmm. And I give him some credit for that. And one final point, and that is that the key vote in 1996 is that Perot vote. And those, if Republicans are successful in 96 as they were in 94, in demonstrating that they had something to appeal to people who aren't partisan at all, in fact, they're anti-partisan, but want their budgets balanced, want their taxes reduced, want welfare reformed, desperately want change, even more than Republicans and Democrats do. If the Republicans continue to be the party of change in congressional races, there's no doubt they'll keep the majority. 
That's what Clinton's trying to do. He's trying to demonstrate that the Republicans are trapped in the past rather than focused on the future. Uh, Mike, from your perch in Virginia, do you think party labels mean a lot less than they have in the past? And if so, what are some of the important cleavages that you see in our politics um, that will have an impact on this year's congressional races? Well, I definitely think that the party labels are uh, lessening in importance. Uh, when I ran for lieutenant governor three years ago, I carried uh, heavily Democratic areas, the 9th District of, of Virginia, for example, which is dominated by the United Mine Workers Union and others. And, and my view there is that the people there believed in three things, uh, God, gun, and unions. Uh, and it, I was right on two out of three. Um, and, and so uh, you, you can see uh, a, a chance for, for a basic realignment if the Republicans will realize that this is coalition politics and, w and we stay uh, true to each other's coalitions. Uh, other aspects of the coalition. I was on Jesse Jackson's show uh, going opposite the United Mine Workers Union when I was uh, part of the, the Pat Buchanan campaign. And uh, he started talking about the Equal Rights Amendment. I thought, now, what in the world does the Equal Rights Amendment have to do with the United Mine Workers Union? It really doesn't have anything to do with them. And, and if you ask the average mine worker down in the 9th District of Virginia, what has this got to do with my, my union, he'll say nothing. But the president of the UMW was smart enough to realize that this is part of the Democrat coalition, and he was going to be loyal to the whole coalition. And we've got some aspects of the Republican Party that aren't smart enough, aren't practical enough to realize that we've got to be loyal to the whole coalition. We've got to be pro-life, we've got to be pro-gun, we've got to be pro-free enterprise, we've got to be uh, against the United Nations taking over our troops and so on. If we, if we stay loyal to the whole coalition, we can win. But when the... When, uh, the fiscally conservative, socially liberal Republicans think that we have to move to the left. It, it is a, a move in the direction of defeat. And I, I agree with uh, what Christopher said about the need to have two parties in this country. And I think the freshmen in the Republican Party are, are the light of the future. That I think that that's the direction America needs to go. And I think that it will be a, a long time winning party if we, if we go in that direction. If national leaders are downplaying uh, party labels, will congressional candidates do the same thing this fall, or is it still much more important at the congressional level? Go ahead. I don't know that people are running on party labels so much as they're running on the, the contract with the name of the contract taken out and deconstructed to the, the ten issues that were there. Um, the, the issues that were in the contract with America in 94 were simply ten broad brush issues that the entire Republican uh, coalition uh, did and, and could agree on. And there are also issues that had 70% plus support among people, the balanced budget amendment, uh, tort reform, uh, you know, crime legislation. Uh, all of the Republicans are running on those issues. They passed a number of them, welfare reform. Uh, they, actually, they, they, they passed all of them in the House. They uh, uh, moved forward on others. Some the Senate wouldn't go with, some Clinton vetoed. Um, but they can run on all of those issues and, and are again. I think the other, the other issue for the Republicans is there's a series of things that they've accomplished in the House uh, and the Senate. When the Republicans uh, ran in the House, they said they were going to have an audit, for the for a public audit of how the House has spent its money for the last 40 years. And, and they did that. And they brought out a uh, fair amount of interesting stuff. The press hasn't been terribly interested in uh, how the Democrats have been spending money in the House over the last 40 years. Uh, but by, by continuing uh, that audit and making the spending in the House represents transparent, by dropping by a third the number of and cost of uh, committee staffs, uh, rather than saying it's our pork, we'll spend it now and we'll hire all our friends, they, they actually dropped uh, real numbers of, of congressional staff. Um, the welfare reform package, uh, freedom to farm. There are a whole series of things to where this <coughs> administration, or this, this Congress can say, this is what we did, this is what we said we'd do, uh, and, we, and, and we did it. And so they can run both on accomplishments and on the list of things that they passed that Clinton vetoed. If you want a $500 per child tax credit, you reelect this House. But very, and very specific and very successful accomplishments, and yet they made a fundamental planning strategic error, which is that they did it all in clumps. The American people right now do not pick... The average American is not watching us here, whenever if this is on live or whenever this is on. The average American is watching something else on, on uh, ABC, NBC, Fox, whatever. Or during the convention, they were watching anything but network TV. Uh, and so you pass health care reform and welfare reform and uh, uh, relief for small business all at the same time, and no one heard anything. It's like a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. The House did more work in the first 100 days of its 
uh, with a lot of the accomplishments that you spoke of, but nobody knew that they had done anything because it was done so fast, so furious. Bill Clinton picks an issue like school uniforms, which is relatively nebulous, and stays on it for two weeks or three weeks. Jumps on the tobacco issue, stays on it two weeks or three weeks. The Republican hierarchy, whoever they are, go from issue to issue to issue. And the best example is when the Medicare numbers came out, which proved that Medicare was going bankrupt much more quickly than people had expected. They held on to that issue for two days. They moved to the balanced budget amendment for two days. Then they moved to drugs for Friday. So in a five-day period, they had three big-time issues in five days. And then they wonder why no one knows what they've done. If they don't slow down the process, they're not going to communicate effectively. Christopher, would you agree with that? Was it the packaging and the bundling of issues, or was it something more fundamental, um, and that is what some have called the radical nature of the reforms? Well, no, I think it's partly to do with, with the, uh, the award of credibility that people will make to those who are making the point. They may say, I agree with what you say, but I don't think you believe it yourself, mm -hmm. sort of thing. And um, I think that the Republican Party in this incarnation has to suffer from that tremendously, because there is perfectly self-evidently, uh, an absolute want of conviction in its leadership. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, evolved, I, evolved, I evolved a heartless game in San Diego, which was to stop delegates at random in elevators and men's rooms and places like that, uh, hoping not to have my intentions mistaken or misunderstood. <laughs> and to say, uh, can I just ask you, uh, Christopher Hitchens here, um, if Jack Kemp was the nominee and the smile would stay pasted on at this point, because the, the name Jack Kemp was an upbeat name, if Jack Kemp was the nominee, I would ask, do you think he would pick Bob Dole as his running mate? The smile disappeared. I didn't get anyone to say, obviously, he would, yes. It was so self-evident that he would not. Um, and the, the House of Cards aspect of, of it, I think, is what repels people. Um, and they, they realize that the deck of cards, to sustain the metaphor, is what's being put before them as an issue. They're trying to find the, your, we are trying to find your G-spot. How are we doing? Mm -hmm. it's, not very, it's not very persuasive. Can I... Um, amplify the point that Grover made with a point that I'm stealing from him that he made to me in the break, one observation. In, in Massachusetts, um, it seems, if we consider the uh, measurements of opinion to be reliable, that uh, Governor Weld is ahead for the Senate in, the, in much the same proportion as um, President Clinton is ahead for the presidency. I think that's a good sort of microcosmic instance of the fungibility mm -hmm. of the electorate. And I think that... Um, there must be, um, at the presidential level, an element of karmic or zeitgeist uh, calculation involved, which is all to do with this bridge to the end of the century. I think we, we haven't yet properly counted the, uh, or estimated the impact of the oncoming millennium, but I think subliminally, so to speak, um, it, it's almost un-American to pick for the millennium someone who is older now than Ronald Reagan was when he first ran, for example. Mm -hmm. And I've, I have read findings, but I think Mr. Luntz, I'd like to know if he can confirm them, that actually the older people are, the more suspicious they are of people of their own vintage. They know how crumbly the situation can get. You know? Well, I mean, Bob Dole made his biggest gains in the post-convention bounce among the 18 to 34-year-olds and the next most among 35 to 49-year-olds. Very interesting. So that, well, Reagan's best groups in 1984 when he was getting re-elected were the youngest voters. I think part, part of that age issue is, is that people who became 21 years of age between 1930 and 1950, a period of democratic uh, dominance when big government and big unions and big business fought big wars and did big things, and, and people thought of themselves much more in terms of large institutions, and more democratic, because if you were in the North or the West, you were more likely to be a Democrat uh, than not coming of age 30 to 1930, 1950. Those people are now 66 to 86 years of age. And so when you say, how come Bob Dole doesn't do better among older voters, that's a more democratic um, age cohort. And it's also an age cohort that isn't used to personal computers. They thought that IBM was going to invent one big computer and we'd run Social Security and everything else through it because that's what the science fiction writers were saying at the time, that everything was going to be large and everyone would go work in factories from 9 to 5. And in point of fact, we've moved much more uh, towards a decentralized world in a number of different ways. And the, the older age cohort is not only out of sync in a partisan way, they're more democratic, mm -hmm. I think they're less likely to see Jack Kemp's way of looking at a, at a dynamic economy uh, with, with tens. They're now more self-employed 
businessmen and women in this country than there are labor union members. That's not what somebody who came of age in 1935 thought the world would look like. If I could pick up on the age issue relative to the congressional elections, it, it's my opinion that uh, the, uh, the older Republicans that have been around here for a long time are at least r relatively devoid of, of conviction compared to the younger people that are coming up in the party. Uh, the, peop the freshman class, I think, is, was, was outstanding in terms of, of their, they believed the stuff they, they ran on. And some of the people that, that were surrounding them uh, really uh, didn't necessarily uh, do that. But I think that the, the freshman class as a whole believed it. And I think that the new crop of people that are running uh, for the House and the Senate absolutely believe what they say. And that conviction and the difference between uh, their beliefs and the, and the Democrats is stark. And I think the American people really do have a, have a realistic choice between uh, philosophies when you look at the, the younger people that are running for Congress and the Senate for the first time this year. If party labels are a lot less important, what are the kinds of cleavages that are going to be important? We've heard a lot about gender. Are we going to have a society more divided by income, by age? We've heard a lot about class politics in this election. Frank? Well, I, I, whenever I hear the, the concept of cleavage politics after Dick Morris and the Jefferson <laughs> Hotel, it, I, I have a completely different view. I keep thinking of $200 per hour, and I'm definitely in the wrong business, I will tell you that. What about triangulation? <laughs> Yes, well, I don't think it was so strange that she was on the phone saying, that's Bill Clinton. It was when he was on the phone saying, I know that female voice. <laughs> anyway. Uh, All right, let's move on. Yes. Uh, what, I think what is, age is going to be an issue. Look, we're going to deal with Social Security at some point. It may not be the next two years. It may not be the next four years. I don't know when it's going to be. And I'm scared to death when it's going to happen. But you've got a generation out there that is far more likely to believe in the existence of UFOs than to believe that Social Security will exist when they retire. And it's not just Social Security, it's Medicare, it's the whole entitlement program and their relationship with government. The Generation Xers have grown up believing that government just doesn't work, that, that it doesn't function, that it's a hindrance, not a help. And it's very different than the older baby boomers moving up through the FDR generation. And so you will see more divisions by age as we move into the next millennium. Generational warfare? You, generational warfare and the interesting thing is that you also see a gender gap which is far greater among younger voters than it is among the oldest voters that the and this also has to do with the life cycle the unmarried professional woman has nothing in common politically with the unmarried professional man they just are completely at opposite ends of the political spectrum and it takes till they get together and have that first child before you start to see a unity of political ideas. If they get together. Yeah, well, that's a whole other question which I will leave to other people. And so you're going to see not just an age difference, but you're going to see a gender slash age and a status, a life status difference which will grow with time rather than shrink. Pat Buchanan talked a lot about class differences um, in his campaign. Do you see class cleavages? No. I don't accept that. Do I really don't accept that at all. You know the old story about the, uh, the Rhodes Scholar, um, the American, who meets his um, Oxford professor years later at a conference, and the professor says, so nice to see you again. I, we've lost touch. What, you, what have you been doing? And the American says, well, I've been doing a, a thesis on the, the survival of the class system in the United States. And the Oxford professor says, oh, frightfully interesting. I didn't think they had a class system in the United States. The guy says, well, no, nobody does. That's how it survives. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, th I mean, one of the things that has, I've been in, in this country, I've been an immigrant here for 15 years now, I think. I, a lot of things have stopped surprising me completely. Some still do. The way that people will tell you about their therapists or their religious confession upon meeting still <laughs> startles me. On United Airlines, they'll tell you about their shrink. Um, I still, I guess I'm still a bit amazed, even though I'm in favor of, um, of the right to bear arms. I am sort of amazed at the extent to which this right is... is uh, Evoked, so to speak. But the other thing is, I'm really amazed that, that, that you can offer a member of the House or Senate a common law bribe. Um, the, the domination of the thing simply by large bundles of money. And, and also by the, the, constituents, the, the constitution of it by people who, um, to whom that's, you know, not entirely foreign mm -hmm. uh, to their nature. Um, the number of people earning more than a, a an average of about a million dollars who are already in the legislature is extremely high and growing. Mm -hmm. It's increasingly a, a profession attracting either those who have money or those who want to speak the language very mm -hmm. easy to learn of those who have got it. 
I think that um, there will be, will and should be a populist revolt against that. I hope it will not be led by fascists. Mike? Well, I, I think there is a, uh, at least within the Republican Party, where I've spent a lot of time in the last few years, there's a definite class system. And there is a, a distrust of people who, who come to the, uh, to the party uh, for the purpose of advancing uh, social conservatism. And I, I was at a, um, the other Jefferson Hotel down in Richmond, Virginia, at a, at a luncheon for a, a senatorial candidate uh, a few months ago with... Um, very, very much the, uh, the country club set of the Republican Party. And I said the most practical thing the Republican Party could do, the practical thing, is to be absolutely committed to the pro-life cause because we get a clear bump every time we do that. And these people were all uh, ready to uh, uh, deny my existence for, for saying such a thing because it, it, is, it, is, such a, it is not something that they're norm, uh, they normally hear in the, in the circles that they run in, the social circles that they run in. And uh, I think there's a very real problem in uh, the Republican Party accepting the fact that if we're going to uh, be successful, we have got to break down the class barriers that exist. We have a winning coalition available to us, but it cuts across a whole lot of things. And, and the people that, uh, uh, the John Warners of this world, simply have got to understand that people that don't own polo ponies uh, have the right to be leaders in the Republican Party as well. Do you see the division being fatal? Well, it depends on, on the, there's only one group that, that can uh, control that, and that is the people th that want to make the cleavage, that, that uh, want to make the split within the Republican Party. The, uh, the George Bush crowd, if you will, want to divide off the, the social conservatives. They're the kind of the ugly cousins they want to keep on the back of the bus. And, and I think that, that until uh, the whole Republican team is embraced warmly, Republicans will not be a, a dominating party. We, we have the potential of being a dominating party because we've got the right ideas as a coalition. But we aren't loyal to each other's first principles. When we get that, that message straight, then we're going to win. Actually, I'd like to make the counter-argument that I think the Republican Party today uh, is much more unified and ideologically coherent than it was 10 years or 20 years ago. When, when you go back to the time of Richard Nixon in 1968-72, um, there were Republican governors at the time who viewed the role of the governor as to spend more money and raise taxes. We had, we had Milliken and Rhodes and, and Sargent and, and big government Republicans, um, and not just Rockefeller Republicans, but Ri Richard Nixon himself uh, introduced all sorts of new taxes, new regulations, wage and price controls, detente. I mean, if Richard Nixon came back to life today and was a member of the House of Representatives as, as a Republican, He'd be the most left-wing uh, member of the Republican caucus. I mean, Jim Leach wouldn't talk to him. I mean, he's, he's, he's <laughs> off the scale. Now, you can also do that with John F. Kennedy coming back. The Democrats wouldn't let him in the room either. Um, but it really does, it, it's interesting for the Republicans that you not only have a more conservative, certainly in all the uh, uh, economic issues, anti-tax, none of the Republican governors elected in the 90 and 94 cycle have turned around and tried to raise taxes or increase spending or have new government programs. They've all moved in a Reagan direction. Uh, it, talking to people on the House, we got a majority of the House caucus, Republicans in the House, to be Reagan Republicans by 84. It took until 94 to have a Reagan majority among Republicans in the Senate. This next election, when you talk about how well the Republicans do, I think the Republicans will pick up in both the House and the Senate, but the big gain will be among Reagan Republicans because in the, in the Senate and in the House, the people who are retiring are the old Nixon Republicans, um, people from that era, both ideologically and, and chronologically. So but look at the Republican Party. They agree on the contract, taxes, tort reform, spending issues, um, SDI, foreign policy issues. Where you have um, a debate, and I think it's, 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 um, is, is on abortion, some of the social issues, you, you, but when a left-wing Republican wants to cut the budget, deregulate, sell off everything, privatize, and is pro-choice on abortion, I mean, that's not, a re that's not a party that's falling apart. It's a party that's having an argument about a couple of uh, several important issues on, on the social side. But look at the amount of, of unity and agreement within the party, uh, and growing parties will always have some divisions. I, I, I wouldn't want a party like the kind they have in Britain with seven members who agree on everything, but they've purged everybody who didn't agree. Well, I, I think it's just a matter of, of, of being smart and being loyal, because there are a lot of us that come to politics that 
uh, have uh, as secondary or tertiary uh, points of our philosophy the issues you outline. But I wouldn't go to war over any of those things. They don't mean anything to me. Uh, what I want to see accomplished in Congress is to get rid of the National Endowment for the Arts completely. I want to see the elimination of the U.S. Department of Education completely. I want to see uh, uh, some advancement on the pro-life cause. Uh, we don't get the, the social conservatives uh, really are the foot soldiers the re of the Reagan Revolution. And that's the difference. There are two differences between Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan. One is Barry Goldwater was mean. Ronald Reagan is eminently nice. And the other is Ronald Reagan brought the social conservatives in, as well as the economic and foreign policy conservatives. And, and until the whole Republican leadership understands that, that we've got to have the whole team and we've got to be loyal to the troops, if the United Mine Workers president can understand he's got to stand up for the ERA when, when the members of his union don't agree with them, when, when the Republicans can learn that message in reverse, we've got something to talk about. But the contract with, with America is devoid of anything meaningful that will get the social conservatives activated. And they're starting to look at things like the U.S. Uh, the US Taxpayers Party uh, and Howard Phillips and, and, and others because they're so upset with the lack of any meaningful advancement on their fronts. They're willing to be good foot soldiers and help out on the other fronts on the fronts of, you know, sure we believe in lower taxes, sure we believe in the other, other things, but those are way down the, the, the list of importance. And school, I think it's... School choice you school choice, unimportant? But where's the advance? Where have we made a, a, a real gain on school choice? It's not a, unimportant. Ohio, but, Wisconsin, okay, I mean, across we're talking the about state the, level? We're talking about the state level. I'm talking about in Congress. That's the focus of our panel, I thought. Uh, <laughs> we are not making any advancements on the issues that really matter to the 20 to 30 percent of the of the workers of the party that go out and ring the doorbell, stuff the envelopes, and so on. And I think we've got a, a real rebellion on our hand. They're they're basically the pro element within the Republican Party. They really don't care about Republicanism. They care about these group of issues, and they want some advancement Could, on the yes, issues. Mind if I just ask you, and, and forgive yeah. me for not knowing the answer, yeah. but how do you come out on NAFTA and GATT and the World Trade Organization? I'm against all of them. That would have been my guess. Yeah. But, uh, that's I'm also Michael News lawyer, that, yeah. uh, the, the soldier who refuses to uh, fight for the United Nations. So I mean, there's another. I thought that was a very interesting aspect yeah. of the Republican convention, by the way, was the, um, about every four speeches there was an attack on, on the UN. Yeah. It seemed to me that having denied the delegates um, the red meat of um, the unborn child, right. the, the, uh, the issue for the, the, the deep-throated roar was um, the Red Army and Blue Berets, or whatever it, it is from the, Mr. Welch's Blue Book that um, was informing you. Very, very extraordinary, too, to see both Gene Kirkpatrick and George Bush joining in the denigration of the UN, I thought. Okay. Chris, but, um, you know, I wanted to say, look, if, 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 as I understand the Gingrichian view of the contract for America, it's a free market one and a free trade one. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to me a much more in, interesting, potentially important split. Um, between the Gingrichian and the Buchananite views. Uh, though on social conservative matters, it doesn't seem to me there's that much of a discrepancy between them. But you see, this concerns me a lot because 1994, Republicans did something they hadn't done in 40 years. And it was just, it was a landslide. It was nothing short of a landslide and a shock to virtually everyone who was watching. But 1994 happened because the Perot style Republican voted for the same candidate as the Christian Coalition style Republican who voted for the same candidate as the moderate establishment. Republican. And I am afraid, and I listen to what you say, and I'm afraid that actually even though you talk unity, you're actually seeking to pull this whole coalition apart. That there has to be room in the Republican Party for Ralph Reed and John Warner. That there has to be room in a, if it's a, to remain a majority Republican Party. Because the Democrats won in the 50s and the 60s because the segregationists and the inter integrationists voted for the same candidates because on other issues they agreed if you want to tear the party apart fine but then it will only be a 45 percent party it won't be a 51 percent party well you misunderstand my my import then the the way you tear a party apart is to behave like john warner is when you have republican nominees for office you go out and openly oppose them. are you backing john warner now i am then, then I stand corrected. Okay, you, you, you sit corrected more technically. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, you know, because I took an oath as a Republican activist to support my party, and I, I, I've done that. I did it the day after he won the nomination, uh, when I had supported Jim Miller in, in the nomination contest. 
And so th the way you win offices is you back your party's nominee. And, and my complaint is this, is we don't deliver on our promises to, to the social conservatives. We tell you, yeah, we're going to go out and, and do something about the National Endowment for the Arts. They make speeches about it. They don't deliver. They make speeches on the Department of Education. They don't deliver. And, and when they make speeches about party unity, and when a social conservative wins the nomination, they trounce them. And, and uh, the failure of the Republican Senatorial Committee to back Woody Jenkins right now in Louisiana is a crime. He is the Republican nominee of, for the party in Louisiana, and the Senatorial Committee will not back him because of this crazy Democrat-controlled system down there. The real reason I believe that they're not backing Woody Jenkins is Woody's a social conservative. He is a great candidate, and, and the establishment of the Republican Party has got to wake up and realize they're alienating a, a good portion of their base. If they want us to be loyal, it's got to be loyalty returned. It, unity re requires a two-way street, and I, that's what I'm asking for is a two-way street here. Chris you be loyal to us as we've been loyal to yeah. them. That's in ringing contrast to what we were saying about the decline of party allegiance and yes. identification, yes. is it not? I mean, I, it, it's nothing to me really, but I, I must say it, I'm astounded when, the, when I hear Republicans say that um, the, the, the tent, a, a phrase I wouldn't mind not hearing again, um, mm -hmm. should have room for Oliver North but not for Colin Powell. I just don't see how that can be made to come out right. Um, but as I say, I'm happy uh, that it's not my problem. However, it, I, do, I think you're wrong by axiom in saying that your first duty is to support your own party. We wouldn't have Bill Clinton as president, in my submission, if it wasn't for Democrats for Nixon in 1972, which incidentally was a group mainly out of the Texas Democratic Party, which Clinton was then working for down in Texas with Taylor Branch and the others, who, having defeated McGovern, and thrown in with Nixon became the Democratic Leadership Council, which became the comeback of lesser evilism that we all enjoy today. In other words, the, you know, the, that, I suppose, must be the, one of the moral origins of triangulation. Uh, Christopher, let's turn to Democratic divisions for a minute. Um, Irving Kristol said in the last panel that Clinton was going to move sharply left um, if re-elected. Do you agree with that? And, then, and um, if not, or if so, um, what does that mean for the Democrats in the House? At least since, just to answer Mr. Crystal's point, I think at least since that experience in Texas in 1972, Mr. Clinton has been self-consciously uh, moving himself and hoping to move the country to the right and has done so in ways I think that no, no Republican leader could have hoped to do. And so you don't uh, and I, I could, I mean, I, I hope we'll get some questions on the floor from that. As to the nature and character of the party, um, I owe this aperçu, if, it's, if I can call it that, um, partly to Murray Kempton. Um, we were having a conversation in San Diego. He said, you know, the Democratic Party used to be a bunch of pretty tough-minded white Southerners who were appealing to the loyalties and the emotions of Catholics and Jews and who knew how to keep the blacks more or less in their place. He said, well, they've, they've lost all that completely, said Murray, with a slight note of regret in his voice. But look how the Republicans are masterfully reproducing the idea of a party run by tough-minded white Southerners mm -hmm. that successfully appeals to the aspirations and emotions of at least of native born Catholics I mean I think they fall down on immigrant ones a bit or have a tendency to do so um, and so forth now the, the whereas at the Democratic Convention if it weren't for um, the welfare type delegates who we heard about in the preceding session and um, the moral energy as they see it of the pro-choice forces um, the, it would be very hard to think of what really got them going mm -hmm. Do you see significant democratic cleavages, the Gore versus the Gephardt wings, um, for example? I don't think in terms of their core constituency, the building blocks of the Democratic Party, that they've got a disagreement. You've got the big city uh, machines, you've got the trial lawyers, you have the labor unions, you have government workers, you have both wings of the dependency movement, people who are locked into welfare and the people who make $80,000 a year making sure everybody stays locked uh, into dependency and doesn't escape and become a Republican. Um, but that that group, they all share um, agreement on key issues. What the problem they have is if the Republicans are able to successfully say no tax increase, no more money, and then everybody in that group who makes a living off of uh, taxpayer funds starts to look at everybody else as lunch because, because the, 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 there's, there's no incoming uh, uh, tax support. And that's why I think the Democrats were willing to throw welfare reform over the over the side because they were defending all of the other spending interests that, that, that they had in mind and the same thing with freedom to farm which I think was a strategic error uh, for the Democrats but the question of what Clinton would do in a second term I think in the last two years his model has been 
Richard Nixon in the early 70s, sitting and, and uh, moving over to the to the right as Nixon moved to the left and absorbed much of the of the Democratic Party's uh, agenda, undermining the the Nixon the Republicans during Nixon years. Uh, and a second Clinton term would look a lot like a second uh, Nixon term, largely with because Congress. with a Republican Congress, uh, because he has all the same problems Nixon did. Uh, in terms of what subpoenas and indictments can do to everybody standing near you. And a second Clinton term with a Democratic Congress, what would that look like? Then I think he'd lurch, lurch to the left because the Democratic Party has been shorn of its moderate or conservative uh, wings. To the extent that there were moderate or conservative Democrats, they lost in 92 and 94 and they resigned this time. I mean, they, there, there isn't in the, in the House of Representatives uh, a conservative Democrat. Frank, would you agree with um, Grover's view of how Clinton will operate with a Republican Congress, if that's what we have? Well, again, I want to take the prospect of the second question you asked, which was the Democratic Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done a lot of polling of rank and file union members. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what would happen if Bill Clinton got elected with a Democratic House and Democratic Senate? The people who would stand up and claim the greatest victory and would shout and demand power would be the very people who have the least power right now the Sweeney's and the McEntee's organized labor because they've spent more money. They really have dug deep into their treasuries and bet their whole, this is betting on 36 red in roulette. Mm -hmm. They've taken all the money and all the effort, gone after about 35, 40 members in a serious fashion. This is no joke. Unlike the Democrats who they say they're going to target 50 people and then they don't do the media buy. When a union person, when someone from the AFL-CIO says that they've targeted one of my clients, I know there's going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars of ads. If they take the majority, they will, with some legitimacy, be able to stand up and say, we delivered it to you. Because when everybody else was silent, and when the Republicans were off the air, we took the money and we put it where it counted. And we knocked off some of these weak Republicans. You owe us. And here they go from being virtually powerless in the business community mm -hmm. to running the political show for the Democrats. Yeah. And what do you think the top three items on their agenda would be? Uh, every th to undo everything that's been done over the last two years will be a start. Mm -hmm. Probably to arrest and court-martial Newt Gingrich, maybe house arrest. <laughs> uh, it will, the labor laws in this country will look atrocious mm -hmm. within two years. It would be scary. But I think that it's something that people have to take into account over the next two months. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Speaker Gingrich. He's been a lot less vocal, a lot less visible in the last six months. Um, with a Clinton presidency and a Republican Congress, how does Speaker Gingrich operate in that new envi in that environment again? In the same way, I think. Yeah, like the last two years. I mean, they'll sit there and they will salami slice the welfare state down the way the Democrats salami sliced it up during the Nixon and Ford and, and Reagan years. Will they touch Medicare? Um, yes, I believe, I absolutely believe that there will be a solution to Medicare. Whether, if Clinton gets reelected and Republicans still keep the House and the Senate, there will be a solution to Medicare in the next Congress because even Bill Clinton can't look at that and say, I'm going to let it go even further. Mm -hmm. The system is going bankrupt so quickly that I believe he's got at least that much integrity that he would make the changes that have to be made. I don't think he has that much integrity. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I do think he would allow a train wreck um, all the time arguing that somebody else is responsible. I thought the uh, article on, the, on the, the puff piece in the front page of the Washington Post a, a few days ago or a few weeks ago about Clinton desiring to be historic uh, will tell us a lot about what he would do if there's a Democrat Congress that lets him do what he wants to do. I think he will he will try to think up some radical uh, issues that he can really move the country uh, toward his and Hillary's agenda in a, in a meaningful way. Um, I uh, am a friend of Mike Huckabee, who's the governor of Arkansas, and uh, Mike has known uh, Clinton for a long time, from, uh, from his youth. And he said that Clinton really isn't interested in politics. He just wanted to be famous. He would have been equally happy to, to Ben Elvis. And, uh, uh, and and I, I, I think that... He's got the same weight problem. Yeah, he's got this whole, you know, it's the whole deal. Uh, the, the problem is that I think that what Clinton uh, imagines that would be historic for him to accomplish, this t year 2000 thing and all of his new age thinking down at Hilton Head Island and all this, I think he will do something dramatic and, and do something far to the left of the American public if he's allowed a lame duck term. So, uh, but with I, a Republican Congress? With a Republican Congress, of course, he can't, he can't accomplish nearly as much. 
but uh, I can't believe that the Republican leadership is letting uh, them have a, a vote today on uh, the gay rights bill in the, in the U.S. Senate. I, I, so, you know, sometimes they surprise me. The yeah. Senate doesn't get to decide what you have votes on in the Senate under Senate rules. Well, yeah. 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 Christopher, you had a point. Um, I was at Oxford with the, with the president. I, I keep, kept wishing earlier on this morning I'd been in the first session as well. Um, I can tell you about the inhaling thing. Um, you there? It, it was because um, you could, uh, the president's allergic to smoke, but uh, fortunately um, marijuana could be baked into cookies, for which he's always had a pronounced fondness. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the technical truth of that, of that loyally lie of his is one that has never ceased to fascinate me. Um, I think that probably the thing that, uh, my friend and former landlord, John O'Sullivan, the editor of the National Review, has just written a piece. It's a, really, it's a real howl of despair. He's saying, uh, we have to find some right-wing issues that, that Clinton hasn't stolen yet. And he, he, he ticks, off, ticks off all the ones that he has stolen. For, for uh, him to move up to where John O'Sullivan now is, all he has to do, I think, is come out for English only, um, for a complete ban on affirmative action and probably make a stand against hyphenated America, which is something I think Clinton would find it very easy to do. A stand um, against? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. very much so. I, I mean, it's much, it's much too easy to say, you know, we're all Americans first and that kind of thing. And I think, it would, I think the thing he, he most wishes he had said of the things that have been said in the recent past is Gingrich's idea of um, a computer on every uh, desk in school. I think that's exactly what Clinton thinks of as a new idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's what he wishes he'd said first. I think his image of the, of the millennium is of an America that's practically um, ideologically neutral, where politics is only management, mm -hmm. uh, where the country is competitive, where it's stripped down and lean for, uh, for new technology, the new challenges, and all of that. That's, that's what he likes. That's what he'll do. There is no chance at all that he'll move to the left. And I may say there's no chance whatever he'll be pushed there by the FLCIO. They can spend all the money they like on him, and he can still tell the man will, as he has in the past, where else are you thinking of going if I tell you to get lost? Jonathan Tassini, who's a very good um, writer on labor matters, written an extremely good book on the decline of American labor called The Edifice Complex, points out that one of the, one of the main reasons for the long-run secular decline of American labor is it has spent all its money on unrewarding democratic candidates instead of on organizing and recruiting. That's precisely the mistake they make. That is the condition of their political defeat. So I, I couldn't really disagree with you more on that. How do you see Speaker, Speaker Gingrich behaving in a second uh, Republican Congress? The second Republican Congress with, with Clinton re-elected. I think yes. he would think, as he has in the past, that all his birthdays have come at once. I mean, I've, I've certainly heard people in his entourage say that this is the outcome that they most hope for. Um, just as I've heard people in the president's suite saying that, that the, you know, their big moment came when, when Mr. Gingrich um, cleaned out the Democratic deadwood from the House. I think just the understanding of that is the beginning of wisdom at the moment. We've had some <coughs> wonderful comments from the panelists thus far. We'd like to open this to your questions. Um, does anyone have a question who'd like to begin? Yes, in the back. I think, can you wait for the C-SPAN mic to come around? Okay. I'd like to direct this to Frank, if I could. Um, I wonder, out of the, uh, the AFL-CIO uh, 35... Uh, races they're uh, targeting, how many of those uh, freshman Republican, I guess are mainly freshman Republican, are likely not to be back next section, or maybe next year, out of the 73, how many are likely not to be back? back? Well, they've targeted virtually every freshman that has any chance of being defeated. So I only say 35, 40, because those are the ones that they've really, truly gone after. But in some ways, they've targeted about 70 seats. I am an optimist I don't know if I'm as much of an optimist as Grover. Uh, my guess, if I had to predict now, would be that about half a dozen of those seats that were won in 1994 were won because of the wave and may be given back. And I'm unwilling to specify which ones. But I think for the most part, they will win for this reason. They went back to their districts weekend after weekend. They campaigned face to face, door to door. I can think of one, Randy Tate, who I'm told is now up to about 50,000 voters in his district that he has met on Saturdays and Sundays just shaking hands and talking to them. That's incredible. This freshman class, forget the politics, forget the rhetoric, on a personal basis has actually gone out and worked harder 
than any other class in modern congressional history. They care about what they do, and they're prepared to dedicate their lives. It's not been good on their family life. There have been a few that have had some families come apart, but they are prepared to do what it takes to get to know their constituents, to shake the hands, meet and greet, and so I don't see more than half a dozen being defeated. What, how would you project that? I think that's <clears throat> probably accurate. One of the challenges the Democrats have is not just that the Republicans went back and worked hard. Uh, what the, Demo what the, the Republicans did, what the Re Democrats did in 1974 after um, the Watergate babies came in was they ramped up the amount of spending that each of the um, uh, incumbents had. They ramped up the franked mail and so on. So they in um, entrenched themselves using taxpayer resources. This freshman class came in and actually cut all of that stuff, cut, cut staff, cut franking, limited what they were allowed to do. And so they were forced to go out and work very, very hard on their own. They, they didn't rely on uh, franked mail and, and, and upping it and so on, as, as the Democrats did to, to ride through that first year. They've worked hard. The Democrats have had a very bad year in terms of recruitment. Up against Randy Tate, they have a guy named Adam Smith who ran promising to support term limits and then double-crossed his constituents and was an opponent of term limits, this in a heavily pro district. So you, you've got a guy whose who's, who's central claim to fame is that he lied to people on, on term limits as your challenger. Um, in running against Phil English in Pennsylvania, they're running an L.A. lawyer who's still based in L.A., whose car and registration are in two different states, and who's, as a lawyer, has been representing all sorts of unsavory characters. Um, so one of the challenges you have whenever you're trying to, to run new people, challengers, and this is the Democrats have to find 73 new people to run, is you sometimes get people with big, big problems that didn't show up in primaries. Uh, so some of their best opportunities, you would think, for pickups, they've, they've, they've been stuck with very bad candidates. In terms of overall, I think the Republicans will, will add to their numbers largely because of the uh, 20 open seats that the Democrats have that are, um, that are uh, weak Democratic seats. I think. Uh, particularly in the South, the Democrats are going to lose an awful lot of those open seats uh, and start not with a 19 or 20 Republican margin that the Democrats have to overcome, but more like 30 or 35, simply because those open seats are breaking um, so strongly to the Republicans. Of course, if you're a savory character, you don't need a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Other questions? Uh, Grover, you mentioned term limits. Uh, let's talk about the potency of a lot of issues. We've, we've heard about uh, term limits, gay marriage, partial birth abortion, um, to start. Um, Grover. I think several interesting things on term <coughs> limits. The, the Republicans came in, delivered the Republican vote for term limits in the House, um, but didn't have the two-thirds necessary for the constitutional amendment. And some term limit advocates have gone, oh, no, we didn't get everything we wanted on term limits. If you look at what the Republicans did in the House immediately, first day, and then in the, in, in the Senate, they term-limited committee chairman. So anybody in the House with extra power is term-limited. Speaker Gingrich is term-limited uh, to eight years. Every committee uh, chairman is, is term-limited to six. And then the Senate came in uh, later and term-limited their committee men as well. And one of the things that that's done is that it's turned the people who would be opponents of change into radicals. Um, you had Archer, the head, now the head of the Ways and Means Committee, immediately walks in. He's term limited to six years. He says, let's get rid of the IRS and go to a sales tax. I don't think that's what most people thought that Archer would do upon becoming chairman. Pat Roberts uh, they becomes in charge of the Agriculture Committee, where you would think is the number one, uh, the, the, the locus of opposition to reforming farm subsidies. What does he do? He says, well, I'm leaving this job in six years. Let's phase out farm subsidies. And they passed the Freedom to Farm uh, legislation. So term limits has led to a, a, a more radical worldview by just the kinds of people who, because they're committee chairman in the past, would have been the opponents of change. So uh, when you've term limited everybody with more power than their one vote, uh, you've had a tremendous impact on how the House works and we'll begin to see it in the Senate shortly. Mike, you um, talked about the Republican Party being pro-gun earlier. Dole has said that he opposes repeal of the assault weapons ban. Um, do you disagree with that? And if so, is that going to hurt the party and its core constituency as you see it? Well, I, I, it certainly doesn't help anything. Um, I, I, 
Are the Republicans on the wrong side of that issue, do you think? Uh, yeah, I think that I think the Dole's on the wrong Dole's side, on the wrong side of, uh, of yeah. the issue. I think the Republican Party as a whole is on the right side of the issue. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of mislabeling uh, the weapons, first of all. But uh, I don't want to get into the debate on, on the substance of it. But there is a strong uh, constituency in this country that believes in the Second Amendment, and they think that, the, that uh, we need to stand by it. And, and People just don't like waffles. If you say one thing and then you switch your mind all the time, that's the, the deadliest sin in politics. Yeah. Christopher, uh, partial birth abortions or, or gay Can marriage? Can I just say something on, of on course. Um, sure. term limits first? I mean, I'm sure that um, Tony Bielenson, who I think is not running again, uh, which I'm sorry for, um, made to me the, the point that I'll pass on to you. I seem to be being the ventriloquist for all kinds of other people today, but there, um, the dummies roll. Um, if uh, you get term limits, the, the only people who will really know how the place works will be the lobbyists. I mean, I think it's a point that's not made often enough. Yeah, the, the, there, will be, be, yeah. there will be people who are there for a very brief time, dressed in a little brief authority, totally at the mercy of the sharks. I think it's a point worth bearing in mind. I also think it's quite plainly, flat out, unconstitutional and would be struck down. Uh, but I like the idea, uh, because it might help to counteract Bielsen's fell prediction, that, uh, that those uh, committee chairmanships could be uh, limited. Because I think it, I think it is the the internal encrustation of the institution that people are trying to. That's the plaque people are trying to break down when they when they call for what I think is otherwise a demagogic populist solution in the form of term limits. The, the other side of term limits is that now there are 2,000 state legislators in the country who are term limited, and so every six and eight years you're turning out um, competent, well-funded, well-known um, state senators and state representatives who can become serious challengers to mm -hmm. people who are the incumbents, either of their own party or of somebody else's party. So term limits have both term limited the committee chairs up top, and they've term limited a third of the um, state legislators uh, underneath. And they're really putting some pressure on Congress mm -hmm. itself. And you'll see more turnover among congressmen, even if you don't get a constitutional amendment on term limits for sitting members of Congress. Of course, a constitutional amendment can't be unconstitutional by definition. So I I if there is a constitutional amendment, it's impossible to strike it down. Um, in case I don't want anyone to think Good. that I'm uh, avoiding the partial birth uh, question, um, I think the, 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 the irony uh, for uh, the pro-choice people, most of whom are um, in temper and character secular and consider themselves to be you know, scientific in, in approach and so forth, is that um, it's precisely the advance of medical science and in particular of embryology that has totally redefined what anyone has to agree is the meaning of the viability of an unborn child. Earlier and earlier and more and more. And I think, I think probably the sonogram is the thing that has um, done, done the most to recruit um, support for the, uh, the pro-life cause. The, the partial birth thing is, a, is another of those ironies. Here's a, here's a procedure that wouldn't have been possible to do. Um, till recently, probably, I must say, it looks as if everyone involved would have died instead. Um, but there you are. It's, an, it's another illustration of how science is, in effect, confirming the idea of the unborn child. And I think that a number of, the, exactly of the sort of Catholic voters who were worried um, about the welfare question, for example, who feared that it was too harsh on the poor and indeed might lead to a, a, a more desperate resort to abortion on the part of poor people, and have had worries of that kind democratic worries, you might say, but who, are, but who are loyal to their church, really felt that Clinton could have given them something on this and, and, and are very, very distressed that, that he's not. Yeah. Right. And before you leave issues, one that's not going to hit this year, but it's bubbling under and it's going to explode, is education. Mm -hmm. Americans are fundamentally disgusted with the shape of public schools right now. Yes. They are frustrated with it. They think their kids are not being taught effectively, if at all. Uh, they don't like what they are learning, if they learn anything in the schools. Uh, we almost, it almost blew with what uh, Lynn Cheney was trying to do in challenging some of these uh, national standards that the history exams are, what they were talking about, the things that would be taught in school. It is so close. It's going to take one political person a couple months or some major crises in a, in a school system but it is right underneath the surface. Every time a Republican or Democrat talked about it at either convention, the reaction was more positive than anything else except eliminating the IRS. But do people think of it primarily as a federal issue? I mean, they think of it primarily as a state and local issue, but you say it's going to that's, percolate up to the federal level. That's the challenge. The Democrats are in very bad shape if they want to be against school choice. 
the Republicans are going to have a problem when it gets to the financial issue because most Americans do believe the more money you spend, the better the education you get. We know that that's not the truth, but it will be very hard for Republicans to deal with it because it is a state and local issue. It's going to be very hard for the Democrats to deal with it because they're in the pocket of the NEA who is against merit pay, against merit schools, against the reforms that virtually every American supports. Though it was forgotten, or perhaps better say overlooked, I thought, when Dole threw that, down that gauntlet to the teachers' union in his speech. As, as I remember, that's how Clinton got his sort of political start in Arkansas, began to attract the attention of the DLC types, was precisely by taking on the teachers' union in his home state. I think this is an issue on which he's probably quite uh, maneuverable. Although the interesting thing is that Americans do not, when they hear about teachers' unions, they hear the word teacher. They don't hear the word union. It's the one union in America that Americans still feel remotely positively towards. Mm -hmm. That's also going to be, if you want to get rid of your Department mm -hmm. of Education, you got to start by explaining to Americans what the NEA and the AFT and all those groups right. are and what they do. Yeah. I think you have to explain to Americans that only so many people can make a decision about a child. And if they want their child to have a person that loves them and cares about them making the decisions as opposed to some remote bureaucrat, getting rid of the Department of Education puts the decision-making back in that teacher's hands and, and the school board's hands and the parents' hands. That, that's the way to explain and win education. It also happens to be the best education policy. It's not just good politics. It's right for kids. And I think that when Republicans understand how to explain that issue to people, it's a very much of a winning issue. I think also related to that is the issue of parents' rights. That's going to be on the ballot in Colorado. It has over 80 uh, percent positive rating among people, uh, the voters. And uh, I, I think it's, it's a case of the village people versus parents. Uh, you know, the, it, it takes a village to raise a child crowd. Uh, and and it, it's, it's, it's better than the village idiots. It's more kind. But uh, the, uh, the, what they mean by the village is an army of bureaucrats. Uh, and and it, there's a fundamental distrust of all these so-called professionals among parents these days. And they think that their instincts are better than, uh, than the professionals, and they're right. And we need to have, empower parents by getting the bureaucrats off their backs. We have a question here. Uh, a little more you on wait the for the mic, I think. There we go. Okay. Television ads with congressional candidates now. First, a comment from Carlin Bowman on the current negative positives of the president and the speaker, and then some observation from Frank Luntz on how that's playing out around the nation to the extent that Republicans are using the president in TV ads and how it's working to the extent the Democrats are using the speaker in TV ads and how that's working and if there seems to be a disparity there. Right. Well, you have probably newer numbers than I do, but the president's favorable rating is one of the highest of his presidency in the latest Gallup poll. It's 61 percent favorable overall. I think that is the, the highest for Gallup on that question. Gingrich's ratings remain overwhelmingly negative. Um, I don't know. I don't have any current numbers on that. But Frank? But he is four points higher than the Unabomber. So, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Democrats are trying to use Gingrich as a foil, and it is not working. It did not work. It has not worked in these open seat races. And it's very unlikely that it will work because the Speaker of the House is something distant. People still feel that their member of Congress is, is their member of Congress, something local, something that they can relate to, something they can touch. And now, more than ever, that they've been back at home much more often, there is a greater relationship. The generic ballot numbers, the most recent ones, are not good for the GOP. And yet, when you ask the question, are you going to vote for your member or are you going to vote for the challenger, the numbers that I've seen show that people actually want to vote for their member, for, for their incumbent. Newt Gingrich is a distant figure. He is not their Speaker of the House. He's something that's, that's away, that's in Washington. So the strategy inherently is flawed. I don't blame them for using it, because we tried it ourselves. It's one thing to use it against the president in 1994, because he is the president of the United States, to do the morphing. It does not work as well when it is a Speaker of the House. The positions are different. Incumbent favorability ratings are very high right now, surprisingly high, I think, overall. And so you may actually see the biggest divergence between re-election rates for Republicans and generic ballot that you have seen at any time in recent American history? Not, that you, not that you asked me, but um, <laughs> I just <laughs> wanted to contribute. Um, it used to be speculated in the Reagan-Bush years that there was a sort of version of cognitive dissonance among the electorate in that they liked to have a president who was tough on the communists and strong on national security and stand up for America and all that kind of thing. And then when it came to the House and Senate, they wanted to make sure that there were sort of furry Democrats who would keep the various checks and so on coming. 
and that this was their, their sort of pact with themselves and each other. Could it be that this is now sort of being inverted, mm -hmm. this dissonance, and that they, they want a president who does that and uh, House members and senators who do the opposite? It's just a president. thought. <laughs> um, he's running, as, isn't he, as a bit of a sort of, uh, as rather avuncular and uh, not partly parental, partly school, partly headmasterly. Um, I mean, we asked in pain, fe group, pain feeling, all that. In a focus group, we asked, what, who's Bill Clinton remind you of? Someone said the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> likes the Pillsbury Doughboy. It actually reminds me of the guy that's, that, that always wants your butt. Um, you know, and, He's, he's, he's the ultimate come on, and uh, I think the Republicans could run a very clever ad uh, by saying, I'm sorry, Bill, you just ain't getting my vote, uh, to, to mimic those, those great Budweiser ads. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Uh, yes, I think. On uh, turnout, uh, my understanding of the 94 um, election was that uh, the Republicans turned out 9 million new voters, and the Democrats only went down by 1 million. Um, how do you see that turning out for 96? If I had to make a, I, I, I always like to try one projection for it each time I do this. And my projection is that 1996 will be the lowest turnout in modern presidential history. That we won't do what we did in 92, which was reverse. I mean, 92 was a significant increase over 88. 94 was, a, was the highest turnout in off years since 82. 96, I think we're back down to 50%, maybe even down as low as 49% in turnout. Yeah, one question back there. Uh, Mr. Ferris raised the question about the other NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts. I wanted to ask Mr. Luntz if he has any polling data. It seems that that is no longer a hot button issue. And so do you have any data about that? And any, anyone might comment on uh, what a dull arts policy might be. The funny thing is, Americans want a balanced budget, but when you itemize specific programs, they don't want to cut anything. Uh, we went and did a whole lot of programs, and relative to virtually everything else that's there to be chopped, that one scored very high. But still, you've got, it's got a small constituency that thinks that you can balance the budget without cutting anything. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on the NEA? Uh, no, I just think if the Republicans get the presidency in the House and the Senate that you'll see budget restraint across the board. Mm -hmm. um, so that you'll, you'll see less government spending on that issue and on other, on other issues. But I don't think that under the current formulation you'll see uh, an elimination of it. Uh, we, we all talk Tenth Amendment, but show me in the Constitution where we have the authority to spend the money on the National Endowment for the Arts. It, it's just not there. Yeah. One final question here. Just to take up the turnout point, if you're yes. right, and the turnout does proved to be so low uh, this year. What is the electoral consequence of that? Who's hurt most by that? I don't see any intensity for Bill Clinton. Even with this wide support that he's got right now, the intensity of people who just cannot wait to get out and vote for him is almost nil. Because even people who are voting for him recognize his weaknesses, and they're very quick to point it out. In fact, the interesting thing with Bill Clinton is that even his own voters sit there and they talk about why they don't like him but then they still plan to vote for him. Uh, and the intensity for the Republicans that existed in 1994 is not there to the same degree because it's like been there, done that. So the intensity on both sides has decreased significantly while the frustration among those people right in the middle, mm -hmm. the prototypes, has actually increased. And whereas they turned out in 92 and 94, I don't think you're going to have that same level of turnout in 96. Therefore, it's a wash on both sides. And he hasn't created any Clinton Republicans, has he? No. You saw the woman who held up the banner saying Republicans for Clinton the other day at his rally, and he said, I wish I could sign that and really embrace you and so on. I don't know whether she was a plant or not. Um, but if she wasn't, she's, she's not the harbinger of anything, as far as one can not see. There, can see there are no Clinton Republicans. Not, not that you can see yet. Frank, you've made a prediction. Let's have one final prediction, a sleeper race, a Republican Congress, a Democratic Congress. Uh, let's have the rest of you make a prediction about the House or Senate. The House Republicans pick up 14 seats and three seats in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Mike? Or a race the, uh, in particular? Well, I'll, I'll just uh, make a generic prediction that uh, I think that where you see uh, clear-cut uh, social conservatives, they will do better than the, the squishy middle of the road Republicans. Christopher? 
um, we have an electorate that wants it both ways and can and can have it to and will. Okay. I'd like to thank on uh, behalf of the American Enterprise Magazine. I'd like is to this thank a great all country, of, or isn't it? <laughs> thank all of our panelists for participating. And Scott, do you have a word or two to conclude? Thanks you, Carlin, and uh, also the panelists. As I say, the uh, edited transcript of uh, the talks today will be available in the next issue of the American Enterprise magazine. For those of you, of you who want to follow up on the talk about education, there's our current issue uh, that's out now and that you can get a free copy of by calling 800-596-2319.